from the great days of IBM. Salesmen sing a company song. IBM Big Blue dominated a whole industry and became a textbook model of how to run a business. But now much of the glory seems to have departed. IBM has plunged deep into the red and some commentators are even asking whether it can survive. In response, the company has had to introduce rapid and dramatic changes to undo much of the culture that made it great. The sun has always come up every day. It's never rained in IBM. All of a sudden, it's not only raining, but it's deluge. And guess what? They don't even have an umbrella. IBM is in a, a state of chaos, uh, trying to change and trying to make the moves that are necessary to make them the company of the future. Uh, they're going through some dramatic changes, some gut-wrenching changes with the, the employees of that company trying to figure out what will they be doing tomorrow. We've been given access to people within the organization who are trying to make the changes work. Dave Schleicher is in charge of developing the mini-computer business. Bob Mansfield's bringing forward one of the microprocessors that will power the next generation of personal computers. And Bill Emilio is in charge of a crucial component manufacturing plant. I have some new ideas on how voice input... We've also examined the new products that IBM's working on to try to recapture lost market share. Users have asked for, period. But the diversity of IBM and its products IBM became great because of mainframes, the first computers. They began to appear in big companies in the 1950s, doing jobs like running the payroll. By the mid-60s, IBM was selling 80% of all computers. The man who led it then was Thomas J. Watson, Jr. Today, his words seem eerily prophetic. My biggest single problem is to prevent the corporation from becoming a great bureaucracy which only moves a little cog out at the end of the chain as a big cog moves up at headquarters somewhere and has everything geared together to move at the same pace with no originality and no imagination. We're not that, but that's what big companies sometimes become. Going out into the field, we traveled around with several IBM salesmen. And we found that whether he is selling supplies or a Selectric or a 7094, the sale itself is only the beginning. The, the IBM salesman off. became one of the great figures of American fact, business mythology, with his blue suit and button-down collar. He had the backing of an unrivaled product marriage. range and well, unfailing after-sales service. His success gave off. rise to a saying, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And the question is, could the person that takes Sam Albert was with IBM for 30 years. He served his apprenticeship with the sales force in the 60s. Do I get prominence out of this? Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. The dress was very uh, strict. Uh, you had to wear a hat. You had to wear garters on your socks. You had to have a stiff white shirt. And God forbid if you wore a blue shirt or a striped shirt, I mean, that would be heresy. There were very few women in the company in those days. In fact, in my, my, my big class, I, in my class was the first woman salesman of the company. Uh, in my particular training class. Uh, so it was a very different world. It was a world of IBM was looking back, coming out of the 40s and the 50s and the early 60s, a very conservative company, it, to many respects a very religious company. Uh, and yet the outside world had changed tremendously. All right, well, how soon will you have this one up? From the 60s, for more than 20 years, IBM's progress seemed unstoppable. By the mid-1980s, it was worth over $100 billion on the stock exchange. It employed 400,000 people, and its revenues were four times as big as those of its nearest competitor. But the foundation of its success remained the mainframe, and that dependence eventually plunged the company into its present difficulties. And so as we went through the 70s up until, let's say, the early 80s, the growth of mainframes was quite astounding. 
but it was really a question of, of penetration rates. Uh, today, uh, I would wager there are no new mainframe customers today. Everybody who has one or two or 10 or 20 mainframes already has them. And so you're talking about now simply capacity upgrades, capacity replacement. That argues for low growth. IBM had a virtual monopoly in the mainframe business. Um, it, it is a, a very technology intensive product too, so that there are barriers to entry there. Uh, as a result, the margins have been anywhere in the 60, 70 percent range uh, on the hardware. Unfortunately though, the mainframes require a lot of um, other costs associated with R&D and selling and servicing those machines. And therefore, uh, when the mainframe business is turned down, uh, suddenly that infrastructure, that distribution channel cost, that sales cost, uh, is, is really what's drowning IBM today. The Incredible Universe, an electronic superstore near Dallas, Texas. This cavernous consumer palace shows how technological change has lowered the barriers to entry into the computer industry. Here, among the TV sets and the fridges, are personal computers, being sold just like any other household item. The market for PCs is now growing at at least ten times the rate of that for mainframes. IBM largely created this market, but while its mainframes were based on its own exclusive technology, for its PCs, IBM bought two key components from other companies. The basic software that runs the computer came from Microsoft, while Intel produced the microprocessor. Other manufacturers then simply bought these parts to produce clones that competed with IBM's PCs, driving down prices. Probably the most competitive of any electronics business in the United States. Uh, there's lots of manufacturers in it. They're able to constantly lower the cost of, of the product and the customers constantly getting more and more for their money. What three years ago would cost $2,000, today probably costs $1,000. IBM is still the market leader in personal computers, but it shares only about 15%, and profit margins are only half those to be had in the shrinking mainframe market. At the end of 1991, IBM chairman and chief executive John Akers put into place a reorganization designed to meet these problems. Manufacturing was split into nine separate lines of business, but the company's huge sales and marketing organization remained a separate entity, with one sales force serving all the lines of business. These changes were designed to achieve a number of goals. To make IBM more sensitive to the needs of the customer. To spread the cost of developing new products by forming alliances with other companies. To bring products to market more quickly. And to delegate responsibility down the organization. But the plan didn't turn IBM's fortunes round. Last year, its sales of personal computers fell sharply while revenues from its mainframe business declined by 12 percent. At the end of 1992, the company's latest results showed an operating loss for the first time ever. On top of that, a bill of over 11 billion dollars for reducing the size of the workforce plunged IBM to what was then the biggest corporate loss in history at nearly five billion dollars. Amid mounting criticism, John Akers announced he was stepping down as chief executive. But as the reality of our financial performance in 1992 makes crystal clear, there is much more work ahead to deal with the sweeping changes that are reshaping our industry. Because I love this company, because I have always tried to keep its best interests in mind, those realities led to my decision to recommend that the board of directors begin now to select a new chief executive officer for IBM. With Acres going and the search for a replacement expected to take three months, there was concern that the company would be left leaderless. But on the shop floor, the first reaction was often relief. Well, now that John Acres resigned, maybe we'll do a lot better. So I'm, <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not. Well, I think that's probably been the best idea that ever happened to IBM, probably, for now. I think we need a change, and I think that change was needed a long time ago. Rochester, Minnesota, the heart of the Midwest. Although John Akers is stepping down, his plan still guides the company's strategy for change. Trying to implement it is IBM executive Dave Schleicher. I know John Akers personally, and I, 
certainly have the highest regard for him. I hated to see him leave. He's been kind of a rock through these hard times, so having him leave is certainly a little unsettling. I wish that they'd have named a replacement for him at the time. Dave Schleicher understands the problems that IBM is facing at corporate level only too well. He's in charge of developing the AS400 mini computer, a make or break product for IBM's Rochester plant, which employs 7,000 people. The AS400 was a life or death situation for us. We hadn't been successful with the AS400 and shipped it when we shipped it. Uh, we'd have been out of business. The AS400 mini computers that Rochester makes are the next size down from a mainframe. Prices can range from a few thousand dollars to more than a million. It's here at Rochester that IBM is putting into action one of the key elements of its new strategy. In the past, the company has been criticized for being arrogant and insensitive to the needs of customers, of producing what it wanted to make rather than what customers wanted to buy. From now on, customers are sovereign, and IBM is dedicated to finding out what they want before new products are launched. A customer flanked by his advisor and an IBM salesman has come 1,500 miles from Oregon for a day of presentations. He's considering buying at least one AS400. His order could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Matthew Simpson is one of IBM's sales team. His first task is to offer reassurance. He tells the customer that although a new version of the AS400, the F, is expected to come out, if he buys one of the current models instead, it will be possible to update it. And we've gone from B's to C's to D's to E's, and hmm, alphabet says F's probably going to be next, right? Now, I can't tell you that, but probably you're looking at apps coming up, coming down the pike here. But the sales pitch is only a part of the operation. IBM also wants to pick the customer's brains. Richard Fu runs a cable assembly company which is growing at 40% a year. He now has sites in different areas with computer systems that need connecting. We know there's be a different alternatives. One would be, of course, maybe even run an AS400 down there and then have AS400, AS400 communications, or have... What IBM learns from him could help it to understand the market better. We were making some decisions about product direction, and we found that we were guessing. We divulge company secrets uh, in these meetings. We ask for advice. Uh, we ask for criticism. We get a lot of both. Uh, some cases more of the latter than the former. But it's constructive, because that allows us to go back and change our plans and strategies. After a morning of presentations, the discussion continues over lunch. Every day at Rochester, there are half a dozen customer briefings like this going on. So what are some of the, uh, some of the business challenges? Joining the party is a senior manager from the development laboratory. Uh, you're obviously a growing company, and right? you're looking at investing in new It used to be rare for people like him to meet customers face to face in this kind of situation. Now, the computer market moves so fast that no one has a monopoly on knowledge. We used to believe that if we could get 18 to 24 months head start in the marketplace, that that was sufficient. I think that free space is down, to, is down in months, maybe six months. The net result is, is that we have got to be much lighter on our feet. The gospel of responsiveness to the consumer is being spread throughout the organization by Dave Schleicher. His technicians are now working directly with customers in a way that would once have been unthinkable, on a project to make it possible to connect more printers to the AS400. In the brave new competitive world, customers want to be able to connect IBM kit to equipment made by other manufacturers. Well, they knew that the customer was frustrated. and. And, and the way we knew this was looking at some of our uh, customer feedback through our 90-day callback program, and where they had said, well, I couldn't, I couldn't attach this printer. IBM ought to help us attach this printer. It's ridiculous that I buy this, that I buy this system and I can't attach this printer. What kind of business are we talking about here? That's, um, I, I'm not sure what it means to us other than customer satisfaction. I think is the key. So customer satisfaction in our hands, but they're yeah. talking millions of dollars in their hand. Another AS400 leaves the factory. 
Altogether, IBM has sold 200,000. At Rochester, the idea is to learn from customers. But another part of the Acres plan calls for learning from competitors. Here in Austin, Texas, IBM is pursuing the second strand of the reform program, forming alliances with other companies. This one, the Somerset Project, is a link-up with the semiconductor manufacturer Motorola. It'll design a new family of microprocessors to power future generations of personal computers for IBM and Apple. Within the building, IBM has abandoned its traditional corridors of offices and the formal dress code. Instead, there are open spaces that allow a free flow of ideas. What we need is for each member of the floor plan team to become familiar with the entire process of the floor plan. Two days after John Akers announced he was stepping down, the Somerset show must go on. IBMers work alongside Motorola's on the design of one of the processors. The project's vital to the future of both companies, but they've joined up to spread the growing costs of development. On IBM's part, it's a recognition that the company can no longer do everything alone. The development team's under pressure to push the program along. It'll be there, so you'll have the best shot at the size of the box for 2-1. Right. And that's the best we can ask for. I mean, that's, you know, that's five days from now. Now, the number we're talking about, when we say 10%, 20%, I'll get back to that. Okay. okay. We're talking about the number that we've given you as far as uh, some number we've... Bob Mansfield, who's had 10 years with IBM, is in charge of making this part of the Somerset program work. It's just okay. one of dozens of alliances formed by IBM recently. Some critics see the whole strategy as an admission of weakness, but Mansfield doesn't agree. Alliances are a realization that you're able to take advantage of other people's strengths. That's, I think, a big stretch for IBM. There's a lot that, that IBM um, is really opened its eyes to uh, because it, you're, long gone are the days when you could count IBM's competitors on one hand, uh, and it was pretty easy to say, well, amongst those five people, I know pretty much what's going on. IBM remains the only company in the computer industry that tries to do everything. In the past, it was criticized for arrogance towards competitors as well as customers. But the Somerset experience has convinced Mansfield that IBM has plenty to learn. There are quite a number of things that we've learned uh, about building low-cost semiconductors that we didn't know uh, before we were exposed to and worked very closely with Motorola. So it's been a really interesting and uh, eye-opening adventure for us. At the Somerset project, they're pressing ahead to get the first microprocessors shipped by the end of the year. But in recent years, IBM has often been criticized for being too slow at getting products to market. Dictation. This is a demonstration of the IBM Large Vocabulary Speech Recognition System, period. At IBM's I research laboratory in New York State, scientists are working on something that could be a major new product, a computer that can take down your words. The work's been going on for 20 years. The company is still a major spender on research, investing $600 million a year. The application window somehow. Yes. Paul Rusin's boss has come to see the latest developments the in the program. I can interact directly with the application window. Mm. This is in an industry that changes as quickly as this one, new products are vital. No one has ever disputed IBM's technical excellence. At issue has been its ability to get the inventions to market. Bald. It's not too long ago it took an entire mainframe to recognize continuous speech. Now it's just a single chip that goes in a PC. Uh, those are very viable businesses. Uh, the computer market will evolve to recognize voice. It's already starting to. Uh, IBM's technology is as good as anyone's, but can they commercialize it? And that's where the problems have come in. One potential market is for journalists. In the first transaction of its kind, comma, IBM has put its system on field trials here at America's biggest circulation newspaper, the New York Times. It has 750 journalists using computer terminals, but like other publications, it's been hit by an epidemic of RSI, repetitive strain injury. 
sufferers have to take a break from using keyboards. Rachel Coates has been put in charge of finding out whether IBM's system can be the answer to its problems. Each new user has to read to the system to get it used to a new voice. The computer can take down 120 words a minute and it has a vocabulary of 20,000. Looking up to see if it, uh, if it got it correct. Uh, the words on the screen have to run behind the speech because the computer uses the context in which the words occur to help it identify them correctly. What corrections need to be made? Um, most people are still finding it so fascinating and so new that they can't resist looking at the screen to see what, um, what, what actually appears there. Um, a couple of people, in addition, find that uh, seeing the, the words change as... Rachel Coates uh, says the New York Times may buy um, the system. But has IBM allowed the research to go on too long before launching the product? I think the company was very uh, uh, visionary in that respect to uh, look ahead and realize that the speech recognition is going to be uh, uh, one of the things of future. And they started investing. I understand that they have invested a lot, but I believe that we are going to get to a point that this investment is going to pay off very nicely. This is... So IBM's research scientists in New York State are under increasing pressure to get products to market quickly. Close it and release it to the application. Two, three, four, but the success five, of the six, final leg seven, of IBM's eight, recovery nine, plan ten, depends on one, people like two, this martial three, arts expert. Four, five, Austin, Texas. Bill Emilio, a black belt in karate, has 2,000 workers under him and manages a $1.3 billion business. We're in a fight for our lives. I mean, we have some very big problems because we, we need to go focus on the growth areas of our business as, as qu quickly as we can, and we need to make a transition of getting the resources from the non-growth areas to the growth areas, and that's not an easy task. Emilio's electronic card assembly and test facility now runs with virtually no interference from headquarters. This is perhaps the most crucial part of IBM's strategy breaking the business up into manageable units, pushing responsibility down the line. The circuit boards from here go into personal computers, the company's toughest market. In addition, Emilio's developed markets outside IBM, aiming to sell half his boards to other manufacturers. In the past, he had to get all his components from IBM. Now he's free to buy wherever he likes. Right now, I see myself as totally responsible to the bottom line that we're delivering on the entire planner, whether it incorporates both the value add we put here as well as the parts that we procure. So therefore, we have to be the best at being able to procure parts. And what I coined an expression down here is we have to be assassins on cost. We have to go after cost with a, with a kind of passion that we've never gone after it before. It wasn't in our bill material and we missed The it. regular daily meeting where shop floor workers report to their bosses on whether they're hitting production targets and on the effect on customers if they're not. We missed this by uh, 44 pieces. Uh, there's an EC that's coming in, so we decided this, the EC hits this morning. Instead of sending those to the line, bring them back and then rework them, we're holding them there until the EC hits and we'll close those out. That is an impact and they do need those cards. The rest of them we're looking real good on. See, you're at 2738 right now. When's the ramp to get back up to about 4,000 a week? That information is due in to me today. The doctrine of delegation doesn't just apply to managers. It's designed to increase the motivation of everyone in the organization. IBM has a buzzword for it, empowerment. Empowerment really means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And it's one of the latest catchy words that's on the, on the circuit. But what it really, in our mind, means is, is taking control, taking ownership of your operation, and being able to say, I'm not going to draw a box around my job. That what I really do is I'm going to go outside the realms of what I consider my traditional job to be able to get things done. This is real good, huh? How you doing? Yeah, I'm looking like coffee out of... Oh, that's steak, please. There's some people that are... Uh, been with the business for 25, 30 years, and they tell me that this isn't the IBM they remember back back way back when. And I tell them, well, this isn't the IBM I remember yesterday. You always have to question the status quo. And if you're ever comfortable, whenever you start feeling comfortable, that's when you start sh should be getting very, very nervous because that's when the competitors are going to be right up your tailpipe on you. With the newspapers reporting bad news about IBM virtually every day, 
One of Bill Emilio's main tasks is to shore up morale. The thing about football, at the end of the game, His management team solid. gets lectures on leadership. It's a distinct end to the game. One of the problems we have in business, there isn't a distinct end to any one of our games. However, there are many little projects that we have that all of a sudden we can shoot the rockets off and celebrate. A lot of times we miss that opportunity. I can remember just back last year when I gave the same sort of speech to my team and we had a big success. It took us, look at this, I measured the cycle time. It took us 60 days before we celebrated that success. That is not striking when the iron is hot. By, no, by any stretch of the imagination. And why did it take so long? Because everyone debated it for a while. Everyone wanted to have a consensus of how we were going to have the celebration. And the, and the real answer was, if we would have done something simple and quick, it would have been much better than the elaborate thing that we ended up doing. So the message there is, celebrate the successes very, very quickly, because the next day you will find 18 problems that have drugged you down to the fact that now you don't want to celebrate any longer. Austin's shop floor workers haven't had much to celebrate lately, as IBM's troubles have fueled fears of job losses. Emilio does what he can to keep them cheerful. Probably wondering why I'm out here today. Yes, sir. I know. Uh, I'm awful excited to be able to tell you that your management team thinks that you've done an absolutely outstanding job. I had a lot of bad news, but it's things like this and, and your achievements that are going to make us a success. And uh, in order to be able to really recognize you the right way, we have a management appreciation award for you. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Well deserved. And the Emilio Charm Offensive appears to be paying off. The ECAT plant has been performing well, with productivity up 170% in the last six years. Workers at least say they're confident about the future. Well, it's, it's kind of disturbing, but I think, uh, I think we'll come around. We've worked hard here in Austin, and I think we're doing good I know in this branch. So I think I'll be able to pull out of it. I think the future is pretty positive myself. I hope it is. It's my job. But uh, I believe it's positive because um, we set goals and we reach them. I feel pretty secure. I, this area of the business, it doesn't seem to be as hard hit as some of the other areas, like the uh, mainframe computers and stuff like that. But jobs in IBM will be lost. So far, the company has had a policy of no compulsory redundancies but the workforce, which reached a peak at more than 400,000, has already declined by a quarter. This year, IBM is planning to reduce it by another 25,000. Some observers believe the no-sackings policy can't be sustained. Well, in people, they have uh, about 100,000 too many people, which is uh, one-third of the existing workforce at the end of 92. In uh, plant capacity, uh, here in the Mid-Hudson Valley area in uh, New York, they have at least four excess plants out of eight. In the interregnum between the announced departure of John Akers and the appointment of a new chief executive, people like Tom Fury on the second rung of the corporate ladder have had to take on the role of justifying company policy. In future, they may be able to decide whether the no redundancies policy should be abandoned. It's always been part of our long-standing tradition. I mean, it was something that Tom Watson Sr. was very proud of when he started the company, uh, but that was in another era many, many years ago. I mean, first and foremost, he was a businessman, and it's in nobody's best interest if you run your business into, into the ground. And so I think uh, line of business by line of business has been empowered to run their line of businesses the way they best see fit and it would not surprise me in the foreseeable future if some tough decisions have to be made by those business leaders. IBM remains a huge organization. Some of its plants are so big that workers have to be ferried about by bus. One of its problems is that its redundancy terms have always been extremely generous so reducing the workforce is very expensive. This burden could depress IBM's financial performance for years to come. But some observers believe that those cocooned inside IBM often find it hard to realize just how serious the situation is. You have a company that has had a virtual monopoly uh, which has been an extremely profitable business. And the profits of that business are declining and could decline quite quickly over the next five to ten years. 
and this company is looking for growth in other businesses, but the profits in those businesses are a fraction uh, of the monopoly profits of the past. Uh, and unfortunately, this company doesn't recognize that yet fully and still has far too many people to deal with the, the world of the 1990s. Lee Conrad works in the mainframe manufacturing sector. IBM has never had trade unions, but in a move that would have been unthinkable a few years ago, he's formed a grassroots organization of IBM workers with its own magazine. He believes the company will begin compulsory redundancies. Morale is pretty bad right now. Uh, people feel that they're on a sinking ship. Uh, obviously, everybody's trying to do the best they can to keep things afloat, but uh, wages have been stagnating, benefits are being rolled back, the IBM family is being disrupted enormously, and uh, employees are beginning to feel almost like abandoned children. Uh, they don't see corporate headquarters as being concerned with uh, treating IBM workers as assets, but more as liabilities that they have to get rid of in order to bring the profit margin back up. The headquarters of IBM's New Jersey sales organization. Traditionally, sales has been the jewel in IBM's crown. John Akers and most of his top management team rose through this route. Some critics argue that it's been insulated from the sweeping changes to which the rest of IBM has been subjected. The organization has been split up into separate geographical areas, but teams like this one, led by Duke Mitchell, are still responsible for selling the whole range of IBM products. He argues customers are happy with the arrangement. What they care about is what's happening here. What do they see in their local IBM team? Are they more responsive? Are they more skilled? Are they concerned about them? If they are, if the people at the coal face, the people that are talking to the client, the people that are doing value for the client, are committed, adding value to the client, they feel pretty good. It's argued by some that John Aker's reorganization should have got rid of sales areas like this one and that each of the manufacturing lines of business should have been made responsible for its own marketing. Okay, that's, a, that, that's the comment I would make, that we're going to need to do that. Is anybody you know talking of getting rid of the, quote, perk for the office of the manager? Critics claim the failure to split up sales wastes money, but more important, that it prevents the new lines of business from being independent and accountable and could therefore undermine the whole rescue plan. I think the organizational structure that John Akers put in place just over a year ago has actually made things worse, not better. Uh, I believe that what he, what he did is, is created uh, more and more internal uh, fighting and, and dis disorganization uh, than accountability. There was nobody within the entire organizational structure uh, responsible for running a real business. These were touted as being real, real independent businesses. But what Acus had done was left the, the entire worldwide sales and service organization intact and created independent businesses that were really manufacturing and development businesses. But each of those businesses was selling through a common sales and service organization. It, it's probably a fair criticism. I mean, another way of organizing the, the same way rather than to allocate one, one sales force to try to represent all of the lines of businesses would be to align the sales force with the line of business. In fact, uh, in the personal systems line of business, we've taken that step here in the United States to align the sales force with the personal system. I think it's, uh, it's a matter of trial and error in some cases with some businesses, but in the final analysis, the most important thing I think from our customer's standpoint it will be the value-added solutions that are provided. and so at least some element of that sales force is going to have to be together representing all of the products because you have to put them together in a customer shop. To many insiders, it seems inconceivable that an organization as powerful as IBM could fail to overcome its difficulties. But the belief that the company's reorganization has not gone far enough makes many outsiders fearful for IBM's future as it awaits the appointment of a new chief executive. They believe that if IBM doesn't break itself up, 
external events may do it instead. Economy of scale doesn't work. What you need is speed and agility. And the economy of scales that IBM built up in the 60s and 70s and early 80s is really what's dooming it to failure. Do you ever worry that IBM might not pull through these difficulties? Never. Doesn't occur to me. Uh, we have incredible, incredible resources. We have incredibly skilled people. We have people with conviction. Uh, the essence of the company is the people. I mean, that's what IBM is. But it can survive if a management team was brought in who could run it in pieces in accountable businesses. But in its current form as one big company, I think it's unmanageable. What I tell people is the following. There's a lesson I learned in my life was you don't really measure a character of a person when everything, when they're riding the quest, crest of the wave, so to speak, and everything's going wonderful. The time you really measure a person's character is when they're down and they have to pick themselves back up and dust themselves off and go back at the, at the world again. And it's those, when somebody has to go through that scenario, that makes them a stronger, better person, and that's how you really measure them. Similarly, that's the same thing with an organization. I mean, this isn't the last you've heard of IBM. I will guarantee you that we will come out of this stronger than we ever were before, and we will learn some important lessons after this is all completed. But the point is that by being able to dust ourselves back off and hit, the, hit this thing head on, I think that you're going to see an absolutely wonderful remaking of the IBM company. Within IBM, there's no shortage of people prepared to say that the Acres plan will work and that the company will survive and prosper. If they're right, it will mean that IBM has pulled off one of the most dramatic changes of corporate culture in history. If they're wrong, it means we're witnessing the beginning of the end for IBM, a company that's played a bigger part than any other in shaping the information revolution. Next week's high interest, 48 hours before budget day, Susanna Simons asks whether Britain faces recovery or continued recession. That's at the same time next Sunday, 5.15.